So my name is Brandi Ragianti. I'm an oral history interviewer for Wellcrafted in C, which is a project of UNC Greensboro's Special Collections and University Archive. Um, so I am here with Stephen Monahan. That's correct. And we are at Little Brother Brewing in downtown Greensboro. Mm -hmm. So to start, I would like you to just tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, myself, uh, I'm originally from Chicago. I uh, did my undergrad at University of Denver in Colorado. Um, I got into the brewing industry, like many of us do, uh, by home brewing. Um, started working at a homebrew shop, uh, volunteering my hours, and the two managers there both got brewing jobs, and so I filled that gap, and that's when I realized I wanted to be a pro brewer. Um, talking about beer all day and brewing and just chatting about it just made me realize that um, I was kind of uh, burnt out on the hospitality industry and uh, decided it's what I wanted to do for life. And so I took on another full-time job, <clears throat> saved up for an education. And uh, as soon as I finished that, um, I was hired as head brewer um, at a small brewery um, that's fairly new in Raleigh, North Carolina. And from there, um, made tracks um, to here, to Greensboro, after meeting partners Jeff and Daniel. And uh, we came to an understanding and decided that it would be a great fit. And it's, it's been a trip. We started that in February of 2017. So what was it about working in the home brewing industry that made you want to transition to this? Originally, I had been planning on going into the wine industry. I got some sommelier certifications, and I just, I guess I just really love alcohol. But um, what got me into the beer industry was more of the craft culture. Um, it's just so much more down to earth, and you know, we got Natty Greens across the street here, and we're not competitors, we're neighbors. And we're working towards building up kind of a destination here. And in the wine industry, it's much more cutthroat, everybody's against each other, and you know, there's label wars and all sorts of strange political aspects of it that I wasn't too huge on. And this seemed like a perfect fit for me. I was already passionate about beer and I'd already been home brewing forever. And so it seemed like a great fit and uh, it turned out great. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have it any other way. Can you talk about the process of opening this brewery in downtown Greensboro? Um, it was, it was definitely a big project. Um, so pretty much everything you see around you uh, besides the floor is brand new. We redid all the windows. Um, with the exception of the mosaic tile, we ripped out all the floors here, redid the plumbing, um, got the brewery floor that I wanted, sloped correctly, um, and yeah, all the subway tile. I mean, this, these columns here used to be cinder blocks. Um, if that gives you kind of an idea of what it looked like before. So we put a ton of work into this, and um, it's, it's turned out great. And the reception's been fantastic. And, you know, I, I would love that uh, the beer to be the favorite part of everybody's experience there. It plays a great part, but first thing everybody sees when they walk in here is the space. Um, most notably the mural here. We had a local artist do that. Um, Lee Baxter, he does a lot of work around town here and uh, just it all really came together and um, we could not have done it if we didn't have people like Carmen uh, and Jeff and Daniel, the other partners, um, who are all just 100% in the game uh, managing all the details. Uh, otherwise this project would have taken an extra three or four months. How did you meet <coughs> Jeff and Daniel? Uh, I think we met off Pro Brewer, which is kind of like the Craigslist for brewers. You can buy like equipment and put up classifieds in there. But they came to the brewer, the brewery I was currently working at, or working at then. And they tried my beer. We chatted a few times, had a few dinners. Um, I think we 
we really just had the same overall philosophy on what we wanted to do in terms of our potential to bring you know really high quality um, eclectic modern American styles uh, to this area which it already has in in no short supply and uh, all of our neighbors brew fantastic beer and that crossed with you know where we wanted to be from a business perspective and what our approach was in terms of you know financial goals and expansion plans and things like that and I saw that they just really had their heads screwed on straight and knew exactly what they were doing so it wasn't too great of a leap of faith for me because uh, these guys just they knew what they were doing. Can you tell me a little bit more about what it's like to work in the craft brewing industry? That's fantastic. Um, like I mentioned earlier, our neighbors are awesome. Uh, we've done collaborations with Natty Greens across the street, Pryor, um, Trophy in Raleigh, Wooden Robot in Charlotte. Uh, we're, we're brewing with, we're brewing collaboration with Pig Pounder tomorrow and Gibbs uh, on Friday. So um, our neighbors have been fantastic. Um, the support has been incredible. And, um, you know, we, we buy all their beer too and put them on as our guest taps. So we're all making money for each other and we're all trying, working towards the same goal, which is pretty much bringing attention to the craft industry, converting ABI customers who are drinking Budweiser and things like that um, to craft handles and helping bring that market share up overall from 20% to 25 in a couple years to 30 uh, and eventually um, just have kind of this we're in the midst of this craft revolution right now and you know everybody tells me oh you know there's this bubble and you know, when's it gonna burst and I would say not not for a very long time unless you're in you know downtown Denver or San Diego where they're starting to see those struggles but for North Carolina all I see is us going up sorry about the train um, so can you talk a little bit about what a collaboration is and how <coughs> those are developed and what happens when you do a collaboration um, for collaboration beers uh, basically we decide um, each party decides that you know we can bring value from a marketing quality Q&A perspective to each other and so we sit down and design a recipe figure out what we want to get out of it um, we order all the materials together and we brew the beer together and we do all the cellar work together and at the end of the day we bring half our kegs and half their kegs and we keg it off together and then we sell the same beer in our each separate entity and um, it creates a lot of great exposure for both of us and you know the market goes wild for collaboration beers too because they're limited release one-offs and it's just I mean that's like the greatest part of this industry just that collabor collaborative feeling that you get and being part of something and not worrying about you know pissing off your competitors or anything like that like, we're all just here to take down ABI in my opinion so we all have the same goal in mind so we're all working together towards the same shared interest um, so one thing you do hear that's unusual for this area is you have <coughs> beers on tap that were made by home brewers so can you talk about that yeah our home brewer spotlight program is awesome um, it's that was Jeff and Daniel's idea and it's one of the aspects that initially uh, attracted me to this concept um, having been a home brewer forever um, and, and getting my brewing career started out home brewing and just entering competitions and being part of homebrew clubs um, it made me really want that part to be integrated into our program so every month uh, we have a home brewer come in here and 
we sit down just like we would with a collaboration beer and we design a recipe uh, within reason. Some, the thing about home brewing is you can, with a five gallon batch, you can really do whatever you want. But um, from a production standpoint on a commercial system, uh, you have limitations in terms of you know, what hops you have. And, you know, we're not gonna buy 44 pounds of hops of some obs obscure New Zealand hop just to brew a single batch, and then I'm stuck with 40 of them <laughs> to, to figure something else to do out. So there are certain limitations, but broadly speaking, um, it is a fantastic opportunity for home brewers to really showcase what they have you know, to the public forum. And so as you see on the menu board there, uh, our first uh, home brewer spotlight was with Alex Craddock, who um, owns and manages Three Horses Hops, which they own a, a small little hop field where they just sell fresh Cascade and Apollo, and I think, don't quote me on the Zethos Hops, uh, to local homebrew shops and local homebrewers. And uh, it was a Rosemary Red IPA, and it turned out fantastic. Uh, with that, we had dinner at the bar across the street and <clears throat> uh, just asked for a couple empty pint glasses and just pulled off rosemary needles off of these branches while we were getting ready to uh, brew and then next day we brewed it off and dumped the rosemary in there and we used a uh, fresh well, not actually dried, um, whole cone cascade hops from his hop farm that we dry hopped with. And uh, it really created this beautiful, piney, hoppy, uh, slight citrus um, that combined uh, surprisingly well with all the rosemary. I was a little bit skeptical at first, but uh, it turned out to be a fantastic beer. Um, so I'm just really happy with that. What was the first beer you made for this brewery? Um, it was our Jim's Lunch Stout. And um, it turned out, I'm, I'm just super thankful we didn't have to, you know, dump it down the drain. Because we didn't, we were rushing so hard and I was so involved with the construction process here. And we didn't have a pilot system or anything like that. So that was our first test batch. and. You know, through divine intervention or something, it turned out great. And uh, we have tweaked that recipe a couple times since. But um, just to be able to brew your first test batch and sell it as a quality beer is just a, it's, it's a huge feeling of relief. Because um, if it didn't work out, then that would push our opening date back another week. and. It'd all be on me. So it uh, turned out great, and our subsequent beers have turned out fantastic. And not to say that they're all the greatest beers that we have the capacity to make. Every single batch that we brew is a little bit different than the last batch of that style. And here at Little Brother, we complacency really just, just does not have place in our corporate culture. We are striving to be the best. And the best part about our concept is that we sell everything in-house. And <laughs> we struggle to do it. Uh, our sales are fantastic, and we do our best to keep up with production. I do. Um, uh, but what's great about that is it allows us to tweak each recipe every time we brew it in order to make it a little bit better. We don't have to worry about how, you know, putting kegs out to the market and it not being consistent as compared to the last batch, um, which allows us a fantastic degree of freedom into really dialing in what our vision is in terms of quality, in terms of craft, in terms of, you know, what we want our final vision for an IPA or a stout or a, you know, or a Hefeweizen to be. So we're always playing around with variables like yield and um, ABV, IBUs, you know, what can we get out of this amount of grain 
add this IBU and how many kegs can we get out of it? And so that's you know the constant battle. But um, that freedom to play around is a huge factor in our success so far. We've been open eight weeks and it's been, the Greensboro community has uh, embraced us really well and we're just so thankful for all our regulars and everybody that's coming out to, come out to support us because it's been a fantastic turnout. Sorry to drone on. I'm, so, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. Can you talk about how the <coughs> brewing industry has changed since you first became interested in it? Oh man, it's changed a lot. Um, my first introduction into brewing uh, was with Birdsong Brewing Company. Um, gosh, I think that was back in 2012. Um, and they brought me on as like a assistant uh, sales guy. And so I would go around dropping off coasters. And back then, it was pretty much them and Noda and I think Triple C and OMB in Charlotte. And since then, there's five times as many breweries. So let me start by saying all their beer was fantastic. And the quality has... Um, the quality has maintained that that level, if not much more so. And but like that was the time to get in. You know, two thousand nine, two thousand eight. That's when you basically in those large markets had fairly little little competition, especially with bars that had twelve, fifteen tap handles. Um, so that was the best time to really grow in that market. Um, I prefer to think that we're kind of experiencing the same thing in Greensboro as of five years ago that Charlotte experienced in, you know, 2010, 2011. And um, we're able to do the same thing um, with the added benefit of, you know, all this market research and, you know, all the brewer having, having the privilege of being able to speak with all these brewers around the Triangle area, the Charlotte area, the Triad area, and say, hey, what's what's worked for you over these last three, four years? What hasn't? And having the ability for me to get such great feedback and learn from all these just incredibly talented brewers um, has been absolutely integral into our success here and my personal uh, development as uh, a brewer and um, I don't think I could have done that back then um, so I am really benefiting from everybody else's experience and uh, just ha having that ability to say here's what we did wrong and here's what you should do and talking to all those people has been completely invaluable we could not have done it without you know all our great neighbors where do you see the brewing industry going in the next five years? Um, here, nationally, globally? Here. In Greensboro? Yes. Um, in the next five years, I see another five, six breweries opening up. Um, and after that, I mean, I don't, I don't think there is any shortage of demand for craft beer, um, especially in this market, I think that uh, interest in craft beer in Greensboro is burgeoning um, at a highly accelerated rate. And this isn't, you know, just me looking at the numbers. This is me talking to, you know, all our guests that want, that are just wandering down the street. They happen to find themselves in and say, hey, oh, you know, I really like drinking Stella and blah, blah. And I don't really drink anything else. All right, well, why don't you take a taste of this and see if that's something you may or may not enjoy. And I would say far more often than not, we're able to convert those, you know, macro beer drinkers into local beer drinkers. It's not really always just about craft beers. I think 
most of it is really about contributing towards a small business that exists in your community and being part of growing that business with your community and just helping them find their place and celebrating that. I mean, it's you don't get a whole lot of a, emotional attachment from you know drinking a Budweiser, unless of course you've been drinking it for 40 years, which you know a great majority of their customers have been. Um, so I think that being able to convert our local populace into craft beer and to really signing on with you know who we are as a local business is just absolutely integral. And I don't think that there's any shortage of potential customers um, that will continue to develop as more breweries open up. There's always, all these breweries open up in different areas of town, so each area has its own contingent, contingency of its local populace, and there's just so many macro beer drinkers out there that are just waiting to be converted. So, um, yeah, I guess that's my two cents on that. How do you view your role in the community? Well, um, I'm not really sure personally what role that we play in terms of um, the triad generally just because we sell all of our product in-house. But I can tell you in terms of our impact um, just on Hamburger Square, which is this intersection here, um, it's been great. Uh, I was a little bit nervous that you know, we would be super busy and that would be taken away from our neighbors and um, they would get salty about it. But what I'd hoped has happened, ha would have happened has happened, which is we're helping to, along with all our neighbors, like Nannies and Longshanks and Shortshanks and Boiler Room and Beer Co. And, um, you know, we are kind of in here to help create a destination for this square here. And um, every, every single one of our neighbors has embraced us wholeheartedly. And uh, it's just it's been just been such a relief to see that our being here and being busy has helped bring business to our neighbors and they're better for it and we're better for it and uh, that's just it's just really brings a warm feeling to your heart that you know it's not it's not about competition it's about collaboration whether or not you're a brewery or not what is your favorite beer from a North Carolina brewery other than your own Oh gosh, that's a tough one. I don't want to piss anybody off. Um, you know, it's funny. Um, I think one of my favorite breweries uh, in North Carolina is one that I don't even know anybody at. Um, and I gotta say, I really love everything that's coming out of High Branch in Concord. Um, they are. They are brewing some excellent stuff. And if you look through their tap room, you can see their brewery. And every single piece of equipment and tank is from a completely different distributor. It's like a Frankenstein setup. And I think that's so valuable in how it goes to show that you don't need a fancy system um, or all the best brewing gadgets to produce world-class beer. Um, and I think they're the best example of, of that kind of point of view. What is your favorite beer that you've brewed here? Um, I'm kind of a hophead, so I love our IPA, uh, Gustoza. Um, that translates to tasty in Portuguese. Super juicy, super hoppy. Um, I like um, bitter IPAs, but I think I like less bitter IPAs a lot more. Um, and uh, this one is just super juicy, floral, hoppy, approachable, um, less than 7% alcohol. Um, it's, it's definitely uh, 
our top seller by far. Uh, I have to brew a batch of IPA every single other batch. And if I brew two batches in a row that aren't IPA, then I have, then we are out of it for a week like we are right now. We're kicking it today. We're putting it on today, but uh, not having IPA is, is a killer in this industry. So doing whatever we can to have it on tap is essential. So you have a really interesting logo. Can you tell us about how that logo was developed or who the artist is? Uh, the logo is um, actually just kind of a mashup of ideas that we all had um, in the beginning of kind of what we wanted. And we pitched it to um, a marketing firm, which in turn um, put some rough drawings together and then we put that um, on a local artist and she actually created this logo out of wood carvings. So I think the process is you carve a little bit out and you lay down the print and then a little more and you lay down the print. And so um, over an exhaustive process, this was the final result. And uh, yeah, it, it turned out great. Uh, it's, I, I love it. And we, we, uh, we push out a lot of stickers here too, so I wouldn't be surprised if you see it on light poles or bumpers around town because uh, we've, we've put out 3,000 stickers in the last four months. I don't know where they've all gone, but I know they're somewhere. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, yeah, come drink our beer. Give us money. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Appreciate it.